Hello and welcome to Iron Sharpens Iron. This is your host, Anthony, and with me is my co-host, Greg. In these episodes, our goal is to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Hello, Greg. How are you today? I'm doing well, Anthony. Glad to be here again. A big welcome to everyone who's listening. So, Greg, I've been thinking about mortality. Yeah, it's not a happy topic, but it's something we just can't avoid. We all know that, pretty much, everything dies at some point. Yeah, yeah, that's a fact. Every day behind us is one less day before us. We don't like to think about it, though. No, we don't. In fact, there have been many ideas, philosophies, and teachings formulated over the centuries to avoid the idea of mortality. One such teaching within Christianity is that humankind was created either fully or partially immoral. That idea has been around a long time. Yes. Generally, this idea is based upon what the Bible says about Adam and Eve being created in the image of God. Our listeners can find that in the first chapter of Genesis. The thought is, since God is an immortal being and man was uniquely created in his image, man somehow also was created with some attribute of immortality. Well, that part really has to be assumed, doesn't it? I mean, there's no passage in Scripture that comes right out and says this that I've seen. Am I mistaken? Have I missed something? No, I don't think you have. In fact, from the very beginning, Adam and Eve were created as mortal beings. They never were immortal, even before sinning. A careful search of the third chapter of Genesis will show that the source of their unending life was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. They were told by their Creator at Genesis 2.16-17, through 17, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So you see, they were given access to the tree of life. That tree wasn't there for no good reason. This was the source of their unending life, despite being mortal beings. Can we put it another way and say Adam and Eve's immortality was conditional? As long as they had access to the tree of life, they would not die. But once they lost access to it, they would die. I'm comfortable with saying they had conditional immortality. Sure, it's not true immortality, though. At first, Timothy 6.16, Paul says it is God who alone has immortality. The truest and most pure definition of immortality only applies to God the Creator. If we start saying all humans have immortality in any way, we really contradict what Paul wrote here. We can't have it both ways. What do we think about the idea that while one's physical body is mortal and dies, they have an immortal soul that separates from it at death and continues to live on? Is death really death if we just keep on living, having consciousness, thoughts, pleasures, or torments after dying. Well, this really strikes at the very heart of the gospel or good news message of Scripture. God had warned Adam and Eve to not eat from that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, else they would die. What would have Adam and Eve understood as death? Did God warn them only their physical bodies would die and they would separate in spirit form? to continue an existence in heaven or hell. When we come to the gospel message, we often think of John 3.16 as being a verse that summarizes it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The very contrast of life and perishing is at the heart of the gospel as Jesus preached it. Ha! Huh. Well, we should all understand what the word perish means. To perish means to die, be destroyed, removed from existence. That's just the simple definition of that word. And to see that Jesus contrasts eternal life with perishing seems to show he truly meant opposite ends of the spectrum. That's what you have when you read it without embellishing it. I firmly believe that if one reads John 3.16, for example, and they had never heard of the Bible or of any teachings of the Bible, they would understand that 
To perish means to truly die, be destroyed, and to be removed from existence. They would also understand eternal life to mean unending life. These are just the most basic and simple meanings of those words. What do you say to those who say perishing merely means separation from God? Specifically, eternal existence in spirit form in a fiery hell being tormented forever and ever. Ah, well, didn't separation from God already happen? Humankind has essentially been living in separation from God since Adam and Eve. When they ate from the forbidden tree, God had them thrown out of the Garden of Eden. They lost access to the Tree of Life and began to age and eventually died. The close communion they had with their Creator had been lost. But really, can we ever be completely separated from God? Psalm 139, 7 and 8 says of God, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. Fascinating. And really, the whole point of the gospel message isn't that God has gone away from us. It's that we've gone away from him. Jesus made a way for us to reapproach God, as Hebrews 7 verse 25 tells us. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Even John 3.16 points out that it's not we humans who are making our way back to God on our own, it's God who's made the effort to reach out to us. He did that by sending his son, Jesus. That's right. The idea that death means merely separation of one's immortal soul from their physical body and that it lives on in heavenly bliss or in a fiery hell really comes from our uncomfortableness about death truly being death. People have a very, very difficult time grasping the thought of not being. Ah, yes, something just came to mind when you said that. Wasn't the serpent's first lie to Eve in the garden, you will not surely die? I mean, she correctly had told the serpent that she'd been warned by her creator not to touch or eat from the forbidden tree or she would die. But somehow, the serpent convinced her that there was some kind of conspiracy afoot to keep her from gaining knowledge and wisdom. The serpent had, for all intents and purposes, convinced Eve that God had lied to her and that she would not really die. Don't we see echoes of this same lie in many of the modern teachings about the natural immortality of man and the immortal soul? Excellent connection, Anthony. All you need to do is announce you believe the Bible teaches that death means the utter end of existence, and that there's no consciousness, thought, reward, or punishment afterward to see how many respond with, that's not true, I'm going to heaven when I die, and I'll see my loved ones and be with Jesus. Although most people are not conscious of it, they are simply repeating the serpent's question. Yea, hath God said? Well, Greg, that's to the point. At Psalm 6-5, the writer is speaking to God when he says, For in death there is no remembrance of you, in the grave who will give you thanks. This illustrates what you just said about the lack of consciousness and thought in death. The psalmist here is saying those who are dead don't remember God, nor do they give him thanks. This verse seems to clearly contradict the idea of life after death as an immortal soul. After all, if someone goes to heaven immediately after death, they'll certainly remember God and give him thanks. And if someone goes to a fiery hell after death, they may not thank God, but they sure will remember him. The question our listeners need to ask themselves is, was the writer of this passage of Scripture mistaken? That's a valid question, Anthony. King Solomon had something very interesting to say about death. Recall, he was given extra wisdom from God. At Ecclesiastes 3 verses 19 and 20, he wrote, and I'm quoting from the Net Bible, For the fate of humans and the fate of animals are the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Both have the same breath. There is no advantage for humans over animals, for both are fleeting. Both go to the same place, both come from the dust, and to dust both return.
I think many churchgoers would find this very shocking today. After all, we've been taught humans, unlike animals, have immortal souls. But Solomon didn't seem to see any difference between animals and humans when it comes to death. Interesting. Well, many will look at Genesis 2-7, where it says man became a living soul, and think that this refers to a separate soul residing inside the body. But in fact, even animals are called souls by the Bible, aren't they? Well, yes, coincidentally they are. We often miss that fact because our English translations rarely, if ever, translate the Hebrew word translated as soul at Genesis 2-7, nephesh, as soul, when the passage is speaking of animals. This really isn't an issue, however, as most Hebrew lexicons will define the meaning of that Hebrew word as, for example, soul, living being, life, self, person, desire, appetite, emotion, passion, etc. So it's a word that can mean many things. Genesis 1.20 is an example of the translators using the English word creatures for the Hebrew word nephesh. Then God said, Let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of the heavens. So you see, animals are, by very definition, also living souls. And just in case anyone is wondering, it's the breath of life that gives life to all living beings, not just humans. Genesis 1 verse 30 clears up that question easily. We're all living souls, man and an animal. We all derive our vitality from God who's given us the breath of life. When the breath of life departs from us, as Solomon said in the passage we quoted earlier, we die and return to dust. What we see is that death is the absolute reversal of how God made Adam. He formed Adam from dust, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. At death, the breath of life goes away, the person becomes a dead soul and returns to the previous state of being dust. I think you have the right of it. And to continue on with the thought of death being the reverse of being created or coming to life, just as our conception and birth brings us into existence, so our death removes us from existence. This shouldn't be too difficult to comprehend, really. If our audience can just think for a moment on this question, what do you remember before you were born? Do you remember anything a year before you were born? How about five years before you were born? Obviously, no one remembers anything before they came into existence. No one gets too bothered about not having existed before their birth because they were simply in the state of having never been. The problem arises when we think about returning to this state and being as though we never were. Well, Greg, that opens up many new questions that we'll need to tackle in future episodes. What we've just said may seem depressing to many people, and if left at that, it certainly is. But the Bible does give us hope to avoid forever being in the state of non-existence, doesn't it? Really, that's the whole point of the gospel message. Why Jesus provided himself as a sacrifice for our sins, and why he was resurrected. It sure is. As we explore this topic further in future episodes, we'll talk more about the fact that resurrection is the only hope anyone can have to live again after death. The Old Testament and New Testament are both saturated with information on this topic. Okay, we'll end for now. Thanks, Greg. Hopefully we've stirred some curiosity in our audience to dig deeper and to come back for more episodes. Please do return and thanks for tuning in, everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Iron Sharpens Iron. I'm Anthony, and my co-host has been Greg. Tune in again for more topics where we aim to challenge and encourage you to dig deeper into God's Word. Have a blessed day.